and and the subsystem becomes stronger because it actually has found some solutions that the old system couldn't solve. Is mm -hmm. that you know the, the the dying system will not fund the revolution. So we actually need to know how much of nature we can spend. And I was lucky enough that everything went bad at the same time. Mood Talks, a podcast by Mood Marker I, with your host, Ira Molai. Welcome to uh, today's Mood Talk. Um, it's an edition in English uh, this time, and I'm very happy to uh, talk to an incredibly interesting uh, guest today. Uh, my guest today uh, is Belgian, but he actually lives in Thailand with his family and has chosen this as his uh, new home. Uh, he is quite experienced in the business world and uh, has uh, started several startups. Uh, but uh, most uh, important of all, he is the founder uh, of the Peer to Peer Foundation. He has also uh, published uh, two books recently. Uh, one is the Peer to Peer, uh, the Commons Manifest, Manifesto, and Peer, -to -peer uh, Accounting for Planetary Survival. So uh, that's a lot of peer-to-peer -peer, uh, in uh, my language, uh, and I'm uh, so happy to uh, welcome Michel Bowens. Hello, Michel. Great to see Hello. you. Hello. Please, please to be with you, and, and, and uh, it's an honor to be interviewed by you. Well, Michel, it's an honor to have you, uh, and uh, it's such an honor to have you, uh, you know, in Thailand with uh, our uh, connection, uh, well, our internet connection maybe not being good enough to uh, have both on camera, so we try it uh, this way. Um, Michel, uh, the first question, of course, is uh, what is peer-to-peer, -peer? and I think there's no better person to ask this question to or to, to explain it than you are. So can you tell us a little what peer-to-peer -peer means for all the ones who have not yet been uh, acquainted to it? All right, so I'll start with a bit of a historical analogy. So, you know, for the first uh, thousands of years of, of human history, we lived in small groups, small villages or small nomadic bands. And in such a situation, you know, we are all kin in, a, in some basic way, and we can solve issues by talking to each other. Uh, so, you know, this kind of conviviality uh, is, is a very strong element of society, right? As we grow, as we create bigger societies, um, and we reach, uh, there's actually a scientific study about this, we reach about 150 people, then this kind of direct interaction becomes impossible, too expensive to manage a bigger scale entity. And then we move to, you know, centralized hierarchical systems. And this is a bit of a tragedy of human history because there's a lot of things that we like in life that are actually connected to being close to each other that get lost when we, we scale up. And what, what happened in the last decades is that we developed a technology um, that basically allows peer-to-peer -peer dynamics to occur on the virtual plane. So now what we can do now is have people work on projects together that are not necessarily physically close. But it does mean that within that smaller grouping that is you know, not, not necessarily local but can be a global project, that we can actually have these types of relationships. And I, I think this is a very interesting thing. So we, what, what we are do, we're doing as humanity is we're moving from closed systems where you have to be a member or an employee or you, know, you have to be accepted into the group to open contributive systems. So we see people joining up to create common knowledge projects, you know, like the Wikipedia was the first one, but there's now you know, hundreds of thousands of them. We start to write code together, so software like Linux and Drupal, and, and again, there's you know, now a billion or so lines of code that are uh, free software. So that means that any software developer can contribute if he wants to to this common global project. We're doing design together. Uh, so this is more than just software. This is actually about designing things that we're gonna make. And what we also see now is, um, social innovations like permaculture that have this kind of uh, new logic which uh, an Italian scholar called Enzio Manzini called SLOC, 
small, local, open and connected. So kind of what is happening now is that we are mixing the local and the translocal, and we're creating new forms of human collaboration that are now cheap enough to be done through that technology that were more difficult to do before. I want to give you maybe an example to make sh sure that you know the, the audience uh, understands this. Take uh, bike sharing. So bike sharing was tried many, many, many times after the 60s, for example, in Amsterdam with the white bikes. It kind of, kind of never worked because some people would steal some of the bikes. Uh, and so it was impossible to maintain these systems. Uh, and then uh, once we got the technological advance, then we started putting a little chip on the bike, which means that the people who manage the collection of bikes actually know where every bike is. And suddenly we now have, you know, I don't know if it's 10,000 or 15,000, but we have 15,000, let's say, bike sharing projects all over the world, right? Mm -hmm. We have thousands yeah. of permaculture initiatives in the world. Uh, we have, so there's this, you know, blooming and emergence of uh, local and translocal cooperation that is mediated by these new types of technology. And this is what I call peer-to-peer. -peer. Mm -hmm. It's kind of dynamic. That, and, and, and it's important to understand that if you and I join a common project freely, then I cannot tell you what to do. And you cannot tell me what to do. Mm -hmm. So then we have to find arrangements that are based on this prior equality. And so we have to reinvent a lot of forms of governance, property, uh, you know, decision making processes that take into account the fact that we are both freely joined a common project. Okay. I, um, I hope that makes sense. Uh, well, it makes perfect sense, uh, but there's quite a lot uh, to, to unpack and a lot that you've mentioned. Uh, so at the beginning, you talked a lot about software and uh, about what seemed to be uh, more, uh, you know, about the online world. And then you talked about bike sharing yes. and all that. So I would be interested in uh, whether you could maybe tell us a little more. Uh, is it very technology based or uh, how does it relate, you know, like the virtual world to, uh, to like the real world and, and the local one? Can you elaborate on that a little? Um. Well, first of all, what, what we should say is that, you know, there's things that are easy to do that way, which is if we're making knowledge, software, or design, you know, kind of uh, immaterial in a way, right? Of course, we need computers, we need bodies to do it. But once you design something together or you run software together, you can copy it at a very cheap rate. So it's, you know, it's kind of like why it's a marginal cost. Uh, which means that it's spread, first of all, in, in, in intellectual cooperation, scientific cooperation, and that kind of thing. But then people started thinking, uh, well, maybe I can organize my life differently. You know, if maybe I can organize a network so that I can get organic food, and then you have a group of farmers and a group of consumers, and you get consumer-supported agriculture. These things were very difficult to do without digital technology and become much easier to do once you have digital technology. But what I would say is that the, the primacy is not a technology, it's the, it's the desire to work together, to produce value together, right? Mm -hmm. And then you look at the tools and our tools have changed. So the, a good example would be the printing revolution in the 15th century. So you have you know, the Catholic church, which is dominant. And once in a while, you have these heretic movements that, that come out and they were always repressed. Once you have these uh, nomadic printing presses that can travel from city to city and print you know, the, the new Bibles in the vernacular language, in the original language, then suddenly it can no longer be repressed. So that doesn't mean it's all good what's gonna follow because it actually was followed by three centuries of religious civil war, but it does mean that society has changed. That there's something new, a new social logic has completely changed how institutions and people relate to each other. And so this happened in the 15th century and gave us a nation state and a multinational cooperation, you know, quite centralized types of organization. And now what we have is um, this peer-to-peer -peer technology, which can go different ways, but one of the ways it can go is 
distributed systems. So systems that are much more spread out, uh, which less levels of hierarchy um, and new types of coordination. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't, what I don't like is this kind of split saying, you know, it's technology or not technology. It's a mix of many, many different things. Uh, but certainly, you know, technology is very important because it also determines the cost of choosing alternatives. Mm -hmm. So in, in some way, it's now cheaper to organize cooperatively than it is to organize in a centralized way. If you take the Wikipedia as an example, you know, there's not a single government or company that would have been able to do that. Mm -hmm. right? it's, it's only because it was distributed and that people could freely contribute out of their passionate uh, motivation that it was possible to have a massive global encyclopedia. That doesn't mean there is no problems with it. Of course, there are many problems with it, but it's something that wasn't possible before. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. um, so you mentioned printing and the printing press and the invention of the printing press. And uh, this immediately made me think of 3D printing, which could be, I don't know, I'd be interested in, in uh, your answer, uh, could be a similar development uh, like in, at the end of uh, you know, 20th century. Yeah, I, I, I think so. So this is what we call cosmolocal production. Mm -hmm. And so the way that we talk about this is to say, well, everything that's light should be ideally global and shared. And everything that's heavy should ideally be more local. And so why, why is this interesting? Um, so today we spend three times more on transporting things and on making things, right? And this is a very problematic in our current ecological crisis. So we're spending way too much on material globalization. And we often use it in improper ways. For example, you know, butter from New Zealand is going to destroy the local economy in Patagonia in, in uh, in Chile and Argentina, even though that butter is actually cheaper financially, but the, the actual material cost of moving that butter, you know, in terms of energy use and is actually very expensive, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it, it makes a lot of sense to say, this is not gonna work another, you know, this is only going to work another few decades. Uh, we need to change that. So let's, let's move to a situation where we can do much more locally and so diminish the amount of matter and energy that we use to satisfy human needs. Mm -hmm. the, the second important thing uh, to understand is that mutualization is also a very effective way of diminishing our human weight on, on nature. So I'll give you an example. You, we, let's say we, we want to keep individual cars for some uh, important things because the big advantage of an initial car is that it takes you all the way from point A to point B, which public uh, transport can almost never do. So, you know, there is, a, uh, there is an argument for arguing that cars have a function, but most cars are only used 5% of the time. So, the, so we are making all these cars, they only use 5% of the time. So if you bundle this, you know, in car sharing, but not Uber, and I will explain later maybe why, why this is not a good idea to do it the Uber way. But if you have an association in a neighborhood that say, okay, we are two, 300 people here, let's have five to 10 cars uh, and make them available you know, whenever people need them, then suddenly you have diminished the number of cars. And actually studies show it's every shared car can uh, replace nine to 13 private cars, right? Mm -hmm. um, so at a global level, you have to think about this because, you know, we are in overshoot. We use already four planets. We have the climate change issues. We all, all these issues cannot be solved simply by keeping, you know, pure individual property. Mm -hmm. we, will, we will need it for some things, but for a lot of things, it makes sense to mutualize, to freely associate yourself with other people and say, well, you know, we are a group of farmers. We don't need all to have that harvester machine. Let's buy one for the 20 of us and then we share. Mm -hmm. yeah? mm -hmm. uh, and so this is going to be a crucial way for humanity to keep a very high level of services and well-being, while at the same time, you know, substantially diminishing our cost to nature. Mm -hmm. uh, 
And so there's something perverse about the current logic of uh, economies of scale, which is in order to bring down the price per unit, you have to uh, con you, to produce more than others, you know, and, and more and more cheaply. So the price is lower, but you are going to use more and more matter and energy in order to be competitive. Mm -hmm. And we talk about economies of scope. So imagine you want to make cars. Well, you can make them in some kind of maker space with a combination of these 3D printing machines with biodegradable material. Uh, and you can, can make them modular so that whenever something is wrong with your car, you can replace it locally you know, with this piece of, 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 uh, that you need for your car. So this cosmolocal model would be a model that would uh, bring back to the locality much of the production that today is outsourced globally. Mm -hmm. it, to the degree that it makes sense. So we'd like to use a difficult word, subsidiarity, which means to the lowest level that makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. so sometimes you do need the global stuff. It's not about you know, being anti-global. It's about being rational about our use of resources. So uh, you've mentioned some uh, some interesting uh, points that I would uh, like to try to sort of wrap up. Uh, did I understand this correctly that uh, actually the mutualization that takes place uh, within the peer-to-peer peer -to -peer idea uh, has advantages on many fronts because on the one hand it, it can significantly reduce the weight that we put on, on nature and resources. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, uh, it uh, sort of frees from repression of large institutions and uh, the dependency on those. And it gives us back uh, social interaction and uh, social connection to a certain extent. So uh, That's a perfect uh, summary of, uh, of what I was trying to say, yes. <laughs> Good. And uh, you, uh, you also gave me the impression that uh, it puts, uh, you know, uh, the, the best of both worlds into uh, globalization as well as localization. Yes, yes. And it, it also combines two institutions, which mm -hmm. is institution of the common and the institution of the market together, mm -hmm. you know, in some way, right? Mm -hmm. And you have to think, just to give you an example of, of uh, uh, earlier historical phase, because what, what you will see in history is a kind of pulsation. You have extractivist systems, so competitive systems where you know, it's called peer polity. So every polity, every political system fights against all the other uh, systems for supremacy. And because they're in a competition, they're going to overuse their resource base. So we have this, uh, you know, historical fact that every single human civilization has collapsed. What we don't know so much is that what happens after the collapse, and that is really mutualization. So what we have this kind of, you know, uh, breathing uh, rhythm in, in, in human history, where whenever competitive societies overuse their, their resource base, there will be some kind of social and religious revolution that will say, oh, oh no, no, we need to live more in nature, in harmony with nature and with other people. And so, for example, you can see in Japan, uh, I think it's 17th, 18th century, it's called the Togukawa period, where you see you know, so before that period, uh, Japan was completely deforested. It was permanent war. And then suddenly people got sick of it. There was a religious reformation, you know, new Buddhist congregations. And the emperor started managing the land as a commons for the whole country. And we see two, three centuries where the, the, the Japanese population doesn't grow. So in other words, they found for three centuries in a row an equilibrium between their needs and the need to maintain the resource base at a realistic level of, you know, so that it could reproduce. Mm -hmm. uh, so this happened many, many times in history. And another example is in the 12th century, you have uh, an explosion of productivity in the countryside. And so people start leaving the countryside and the law said you could, you know, if you were one, one year without your master, you were free. And these people started installing themselves around, you know, the cities which had disappeared until that time and, and are coming back. Um, and they form guilds and guilds are commons where, you know, the, the means of production, so the machines that they use are, you know, are property of the guild. And you have masters, fellows and, and, and apprentices and a master can only have seven fellows. So these workers created a system and a market system that 
protected their interests, right? The kind of, it, so guild was a social security system. It had its own legal system. And the guilds together in many, many cities in Europe started actually managing the city. Um, so this is also a very interesting period. And, and why it is interesting because it had a market which was embedded in society, which, uh, you know, there were all kinds of rules like the merchants could not have a free price for food until five o'clock in the afternoon. So everybody had to get food at the right price. They called it just pricing. Only then when everybody was fed, could the market play for the, you know, the luxury uses of food. Mm -hmm. um, so this is very interesting because what we now have again is a market that is totally, totally disembedded from society. And, and, you know, we have a market state, a state at the service of the market and civil society is, you know, kind of like a, something you do when you, you come home tired. Uh, so what we argue for in the P2P foundation is for a return to a common centric society. It doesn't mean abolishing the market. It doesn't mean abolishing the state, but it means, create you know adapting state and market forms to the common good of mm -hmm. of you know the the balance of society and the population okay so uh i guess everyone will have noticed by now that uh, you know the scope of knowledge you have uh, be it politics be it history be it uh, the economy is uh, just incredibly vast uh, so I would like to uh, make a little jump now uh, and ask you uh, about how did you get there? What was your path to, uh, you know, because you were also in business? Um, how, how does it, uh, how does it yes. come to this? So in, in the early 90s, um, I had come to the conclusion that, you know, change was coming from the business world that uh, politics wasn't going in the right direction uh, and that uh, you know, the, the energy of the world was in, in the business world. And so I created uh, two startups. I worked for British Petroleum. I worked for Belgacom and Big Telco. I launched a magazine, made documentary. I did a few things. Uh, <laughs> but, at, but at the end of that period, uh, I felt very frustrated because what I what I started seeing is that all the promises of change, which were very strong in the beginning of that period, you know, because of the free, the ideas of Milton Friedman and neoliberalism were becoming totally marginalized. And so the time frame of thinking in business was like three months maximum. Mm -hmm. um, and people were getting also more and more psychologically sick, like you know, having burnouts. And I had one myself when I was 42. And so I felt increasingly, I'm, I'm actually more part of the problem than part of the solution. And I thought, you know, it, it, we, I have to go back to civil society because business will not change without pressure from the outside. Mm -hmm. okay. And clearly politics is not putting that pressure. So we have to organize people to do this. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was heartened because 95, you had, you know, the other globalization movement coming up. So I, I was saying, oh, okay, we, we, we see this, this energy emerging again uh, in civil society. But my big question was, well, how do we do it this time? You know, because the old story of, the, let's say, Marxist uh, ideas uh, clearly didn't bring us where we wanted it to be. Um, and so, I started, I took a two year sabbatical mm -hmm. to read about phase transitions. So I wanted to know, you know, how did capitalism arise out of feudalism? Mm -hmm. uh, how did feudalism arise out of the Roman empire? You know, these kinds of things. Uh, and I'm a European and I, you know, so I was more familiar with the European scene. So I, I focused mostly on European history. Um, and one of my conclusions was that changes into a large degree driven by seed forms yeah so imagine uh, the system it works but suddenly it's it's it works less and less uh, because it has solved some issues but it created new ones mm -hmm. and it cannot it cannot solve the new problems that emerges out of its own success as it mm -hmm. were mm -hmm. and so bit by bit the old system is getting in crisis is getting stagnant etc uh, etc cetera, et cetera. So there comes a moment where if you want to change things, you can no longer do it within the system. You have to find new solutions. 
-hmm. So if you take the emergence of capitalism, you know, for example, suddenly in the 11th century, people start talking about purgatory. Mm -hmm. okay. you know, why? Because before, if you were Christian, you know, you only had the hell and the heaven. And if you lend money, you went to hell. There was no, no doubt about it. So you couldn't do business, right? Mm -hmm. But as the cities start growing and they need money, and so, you know, uh, so suddenly people start talking a bit, thinking a bit differently about those things. And so Purgatory says, you can sin in certain areas like business, but then you have to buy these indulgences and the church will pray for you. Okay. Right. And, and will clean your sins in the afterlife. Mm -hmm. So suddenly that liberated all this energy of people who wanted to do business as Catholics and they couldn't before. So this is, you know, kind of a ideological innovation, but then other people invented the printing press and a Franciscan monk invented double entry book accounting. Right. Yeah. All these things were not few, were not feudal. They, they, they were actually the incipient principles of the coming capitalist system. Mm -hmm. And so I started looking for a few years and I have a wiki with 22,000 articles on, on this. And I started looking, I said, okay, did, I, my feeling is peer to peer is this underlying logic today. This is what is happening. Right. And mm -hmm. the creation of commons through peer to peer. Mm -hmm. And I started observing the emergence of these changes really in every field, in spirituality, business, politics. Um, and then I started analyzing them and looking at the underlying logic. And my philosophy became, okay, we have capitalism because we had free cities in the Middle Ages where the merchants could develop their system outside of the control of the state which happened nowhere else in the world. So this is why Europe developed capitalism, right? And so in other words, we, had, we have capitalism because we had capitalists, you know, merchants in cities that were able to slowly create the world according to their interests. And so what I'm saying is, you know, this is a conclusion. So commoners, all the people who are creating commons and are you know, creating value together, well, we should do the same. We should look at how we can create market forms and state forms that work for us, work for the commons. Mm -hmm. And this is how we're going to change society. So first we plant seeds, then we interconnect the seeds, then we grow social and political power, and we create new institutions. So mm -hmm. this is kind of like a summary of my, you know, my, my intellectual uh, journey. And so once I got this clear in my head, then I, I, I created the P2P Foundation and people who liked my ideas, which they could read on a blog in the wiki, started working with me and, you know, we became a network. And so then we created the P2P Lab, which is in Greece, which uh, has uh, 10 people full time. We created uh, communications and, and uh, it's called Commons Transition Project. Um, so these organizations are autonomous because, you know, we believe in autonomy. Um, and what I'm doing after 10 years of more organizational work, I want to go back to uh, basically historical research. And I want to, you know, uh, spend again two, three years studying on a, at a deeper level, uh, kind of creating a history of the world according to the commons, uh, creating a genealogy uh, mm -hmm. for this emerging new world. Okay. Um, you've already talked a bit about the Peer-to-Peer -peer Foundation and uh, what you actually do. Uh, would you say that the Peer-to-Peer -peer Foundation as such is also one of those seed forms uh, that you've described? Uh, and uh, to what extent does the Peer-to-Peer -peer Foundation sort of live and embody um, th these new uh, things? Well, well, to a certain degree, I would say. Uh... You know, we, I, you know, I can give you two examples. So the P2P lab, you know, has found an arrangement. So it's very pragmatic, but mm -hmm. uh, we, they compete for EU uh, funding. They become very good at it. With that funding, they, f they fund the doctoral research of their members mm -hmm. who then get PhDs. Um, and, you know, and so they created a virtuous circle of mutual support to grow, you know, mm -hmm. one by one, the uh, you know, a team of equals. 
Um, and the uh, Commons Transition team just launched a project called Disco. I forgot exactly what it means, but it's um, uh, this, you know, it's a distributed autonomous organization model, which integrates the principles of the care economy in, in its operation. So they are also doing that on my own. I'm a bit of an outsider because I live half my time in Thailand, uh, half my time in Europe. Uh, and so it's a bit complicated for me to, you know, be in these fixed systems. Um, but um, uh, so that's what my colleagues are doing. So trying to create models, you know, that work for them as an autonomous uh, entity so mm -hmm. that they can grow over time and, and keep existing. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I work at a more meta level. I, you know, I'm, I try to see the, the network and our, and these autonomous entities with ideas and analysis and uh, you know kind of uh, intellectual food if you like right mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not implying they're not doing it in their own way as well but for me my desire is that this is my specialization I want to give all my time to observing and thinking the, the emergence of this movement and I consider myself a bit like what Gramsci called an organic intellectual right so okay. so what, what that means is that you're you you're connected to the movement that you describe right it's not outside in it's i visit commons i talk to commons i do studies about the commons i travel i speak um so you know i i i, I need to feel the pulse of the movement in order to to say interesting things about it right i cannot mm -hmm. and so i build my theory uh, all the words you, I think you had you said something about vocabulary in the beginning. So all the words we use in the P2P foundation are words that come from the movement. Okay. I, I don't invent them. I I I take them from other people and I see how they connect. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, so it's a you know it's a fabrication of concept. But it's not a pure invention. It's actually linked to this emergence of these seed forms. And trying to look at the underlying structures, mm -hmm. and I think that's a, that's a weakness in you know in postmodern thinking is that they mostly abandon structural thinking, mm -hmm. uh, and and so I want to keep this legacy of thinking in terms of structures. I think that is very important. Mm -hmm. You know, what are the classes? What are the groups? What are the uh, you know? Okay. Um, I would like to pick up on a metaphor that you've just used, uh, which sort of resonated to me. Uh, you, you said you want to be in touch with the pulse of the movement. Uh, so uh, this uh, brings me to, you know, to ask about uh, concrete examples and uh, about, uh, you know, those seed forms. Uh, you okay. mentioned permaculture and uh, you, you mentioned several examples, but could you elaborate a little on them? Uh, and give very concrete ones, uh, you know, where, where you can talk about the pulse and how people actually live it, where they do it, well, I, how they do yeah, it. Yeah, I can give you a few examples. One that is uh, one of my favorites uh, that I visited several times is called Curto Café. Mm -hmm. And this was a, a director of a coffee company and he said, why is it that in Brazil, and you know, I'm talking about 20 years ago, mm -hmm. we cannot drink good coffee yeah. because the best coffee was exported. And why is it the people who make the coffee are starving, right? It's so expensive in the West, and yet the people who actually do all the work, they, they, they don't get rewarded. Mm -hmm. And he's, he also decided not to do a, f a fair trade. This, this, this certification process is too expensive mm -hmm. and also puts you in dependency on these European and, and Western organizations. So he said, let's do full transparency. So basically he said, where we get a coffee from you will know so who how much we pay for the coffee this is all visible mm -hmm. second he created he created a machine for distributed coffee roasting so a machine that could be placed directly at the farmers themselves and which quadruple their income mm -hmm. right by by this intervention it's kind of a 3d printer for roasting mm -hmm. so it quadrupled their income then he created a coffee common. So all the recipes, all the experiments in, you know, blends and mixing blends was, uh, you know, shared as a knowledge for everyone. Then they did crowdfunded retail expansion. So they asked their community, like, if you want to drink our coffee, you know, we want to 
it's in the shopping mall this is you know x thousand euros per uh per year or per month mm -hmm. per year uh and please support us so and the people would you know pay they got get got shares and the interest of the shares is free coffee right yeah uh and then they opened uh they opened the first uh, little space uh but that was there last year in december um, no a year ago in december and now they have two or three huge hangars right so they they're doing it with chocolate they're doing it with cheese and what's interesting about these forms it has nothing to do with the classic capitalist supply chain and, and production consumption split it's an ecosystem right mm -hmm. where everybody's working together and so the people then go to the shop and those that you know didn't uh, do the crowdfunding they um it's pay what you want but you have a poster explaining why the coffee costs the price they ask mm -hmm. and so you you buy a little jet, uh, jeton i don't know you say that in english a little coin mm -hmm. then you you know you, you pay the money you want you get the coin and you get your coffee uh, but i hope you what you get is this is a totally different way of thinking about production and and, yes. and, and consumption right mm -hmm. it's a whole ecosystem another example maybe in uh from from uh, brazil also is musicians were doing very badly so you have this group of youngsters who create the means of production to make music so they they took a one center first you know and started building a studio and then the musicians could come to the studio and instead of paying they basically created a credit system and then they organized the uh the festivals for them and you know part of the income goes to pay back the credit and so they ended up with 300 centers 30 communes um wow. and a thriving system of music making that again is based on totally different principles than what we are used to uh and you know creating jobs for young people in the favelas which suddenly get to travel to other cities and organize festivals um maybe a third example and then i'll, I'll finish uh, is in spiral which is in um in new zealand uh when i visited them it's already two three years ago they had like 40 organizations i think maybe i i'm not right about the number but you know uh, social enterprises they create a co-op in the middle uh every year they go for three three weeks uh, in the New Zealand woods, which are commons, by the way, because they're crown lands, uh, you know, created very intense relationships. And when I was there, I was witness to, you know, they had this kind of fund where they would pull money together to pay the, um, the advance money you need to buy a house, right? They were pooling so mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. every year, maybe, or every two years, I'm not sure, a member of their network could actually you know get a loan and, and buy a home which is very difficult now for young people and then they had this thing called co-budget uh where everybody you know would put maybe i don't know 40 dollars a month or something or per year I, I forgot uh and then everybody can make a proposal for a new project and then people would say yes i want to support this so they were pooling you know an internal investment vehicle uh so i just hope that gives you some idea of how people are rethinking you know how they can do business and how they can make a living that is really not the same as traditional capitalism you know where you have to exploit workers create a surplus um and so this is different okay maybe one more example because i'm a member of it so this is called smart.coop mm -hmm. Uh, as you know, freelancers have a hard time because, you know, you never know when you're going to have a project and then people don't pay or they pay, you know, with four months, 18 months late. So what they did was that they created a co-op. You pay 2% of your income into a mutual guarantee fund. This allows the, that fund to prepay you all your invoices within seven days. So you're always paid within seven days. After six months to a year, you know they look at your income and they say okay you can pay yourself a wage so then you have two accounts one account where your invoicing come in and you basically fund your own salary you become an employee of the of the, the co-op which are you are co-owner of and suddenly you are an employee with full rights to social security 
-hmm. right? And because it's a co-op, all the surplus yeah. uh, stays within the ecosystem, is constantly reinvesting the ecosystem. Uh, and they have 20,000 members in nine countries, and this is called a platform cooperative. Because the problem with Uber and Airbnb is they are no longer making a living by you know, hiring people. They let us exchange in a peer-to-peer -peer way, and then they transact like a feudal, a feudal tax. Um, and all that money leaves the ecosystem and goes to the shareholders. Mm -hmm. um, so in this case, you can have a platform, but the platform is actually a commons that anybody can join. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this is how you implement peer-to-peer -peer and commons in the, in the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. I, I hope that's enough examples to give you a taste of, you know, how we can do this. Uh, it's absolutely wonderful and really encouraging and inspiring examples. Uh, and I guess it's, uh, uh, it's a question that's very interesting for the uh, audience of Mutmacherei as well, because so many people want to be part of uh, a new movement, of, of a new world. And I guess many of them are struggling of uh, sort of how to put the rubber onto the road and how to really yeah. uh, like also an income around these things. And I guess the examples you have given are, are, are very interesting uh, when it comes to that. Um, so uh, could we say that like the main ingredients are to uh, not see doing business uh, as uh, something competitive? Uh, because you uh, earlier on mentioned that uh, competition has uh, sort of driven uh, nearly all civilizations so far to, uh, to the brink of extinction. Yeah, no. uh, well, I, I, I think we're not there yet because, you know, we, we live still in a capitalist system, right? So it's impossible to completely withdraw. Um, so what I'm, I'm arguing for is a kind of intellig intelligent adaptation to the constraints of mm -hmm. the capitalist system, mm -hmm. and, but also to the political and policy work to adapt the system to your needs. Mm -hmm. And so that means, in my view, that we cannot be completely apolitical. We have to influence politicians that they understand what the commons is and that they understand what the commons require in order to to grow mm -hmm. and um, you know as we enter into kind of a permanent crisis mode uh, in many countries politically ecologically um, I think that the idea of you know reconstructing a local economy where the commons play a vital role is going to be a very interesting uh, thing to do. And I have my own political motivation. I, I, I see the world today in three different classes we have. And I use the, the language that's used by Thomas Piketty, which is on the left, and Emmanuel Todd, who is a friend of mine, is a bit more on the right, but they both use the same language. So you have the merchant class, mm -hmm. which uh, Piketty calls the merchant right. Mm -hmm. free market uh, for the free market you have a cognitive elite the brahman left and then you have the people who have neither and what our politics has become today and this is what explains the the collapse of the left basically is that the left has become the party of the cognitive elite has lost its connection with the people the working class people who have neither and the right populist has succeeded you know, in, in, in creating lines. Um, mm -hmm. And I think this is a, not a way forward because it creates xenophobic, closed, uh, uh, you know, hyper-competitive entities, mm -hmm. which, you know, practice protectionist policies. Uh, so I want to give you an example of how you could do this. Um, so in Ghent, there was a, where I did a common transition plan for the city of Ghent. In Ghent, first of all, we saw growth of, urban commons from 50 to 500 in just 10 years. So this mm -hmm. is you know, yeah. important to know that yeah. urban commons are growing everywhere. But there was one project which struck me, which was an experimental project, but they said, okay, let's have 100% of organic food in our public schools. That's 5 million meals a year. Mm -hmm. And it's already done in, in Copenhagen, already has 94%, so it can be done. So what does it mean? It means you need to buy your food from local organic farmers, urban, peri-urban farmers. Mm -hmm. So you're supporting organic agriculture. Yes. You need a zero carbon transport infrastructure, which is basically cargo bikes. And you need cooks in the schools. 
right? Mm -hmm. So here you're creating local employment that ensures that you have local, fair, and ecological food, 100% organic, 100% healthy. And at the same time, you're creating jobs for people outside of the cognitive class, right? Mm -hmm. So these are, these are not geeks. These are not free software developers. Yeah. And so this is also a way I see politically to reconnect both sides of the working class, which has grown separate. Mm -hmm. uh, so the people who study and the people who didn't study. And, and the, the tragedy of our system today is that in order to study, you either need money or have parents that already studied. So mm -hmm. if you haven't studied, you know, the chances of going, uh, growing out of your social class is is marginal now it used to be one of the main ways to get out of poverty but it's no longer working right mm -hmm. um and this is a very dangerous situation so i think we can use the commons also as a way of you know creating more equal inclusive and ecologically friendly uh local economies mm -hmm. okay um so I would like to come back to uh, trying to find out what what like the the common uh, grounds are. Um, you've also mentioned you know sharing the knowledge, being very transparent about what what's going on, uh, and uh, using this to create uh, this ecosystem. You know because I, I guess uh, transparency uh, always helps to build trust, uh, and that helps to to build. Uh, an ecosystem instead of a very uh, sort of vertical um, uh, yeah. supply chain. Um, then you mentioned crowdfunding, uh, which all, uh, often is an ingredient, uh, which uh, also sort of engages a wider audience uh, and may also help build, uh, you know, the ecosystem and uh, sort of the customers and. Uh, uh, in the way I understand it, also dissolve these uh, very fixed roles. You know, there, there are the consumers, there are the producers, but you find ways of uh, entangling people in, uh, in, in in sort of different roles in, in the ecosystem. Um, uh, Michelle, I'd be uh, I'd be interested in a completely different uh, thing as well. Um, Quickly put myself on on there. Um, have we lost you? Oh, here you are again. Okay. Um, uh, like a more. Uh, I'm a, here. I. I. Yes. You, yeah. So, sometimes it, it just freezes, so I will try to get out of, out out of the way soon again, so that we have full bandwidth. Um, you know, one, one of the things that Mutmacherei deals with uh, is uh, the issue of courage. Yeah? So uh, I'd be interested in uh, what encourages you on a personal level and what do you need courage for in order to, to do it? Well, I, I must say it's not easy um, because as many people will know, you know as soon as you leave the, the dominant path, uh, you know, your, your economic survival takes a hit. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's that's one very important uh, thing is that, you know, the, the, the dying system will not fund the revolution. Um, and uh, so basically, also, what is I think uh, difficult is fragmentation. You're, this is something you're facing all the time, and it's gotten a lot worse now with identity politics. Is that you know people are because they are stressed and don't see the future, they're thinking maybe unconsciously, but this is what's happening. You know, group that's going to protect me in hard times, right? So mm -hmm. on the right wing you have this kind of ethno-nationalist religious revival, but in the left you have you know race, gender, and it has the same effect as people uh, mm -hmm. fight against each other all the time. The, the now, what's not interesting about the commons, though, is that, you know, commoning is caring, right? It actually means that you have a group of people who share an interest in, in a certain common good. Mm -hmm. And so you can use the commons as a way of, of binding people around the shared object of love, if you like, right? Mm -hmm. So we want to do free software, we want to create an urban garden, we want to create you know, mutual 
cinema, whatever it is that it, it binds you together. What we don't have yet, and this is very difficult, I think, is to how do we get the commons to work together? Because you know, if you if you love free software, mm -hmm. you know that doesn't necessarily mean you have an ecological consciousness. Mm -hmm. If you do an urban garden, that doesn't mean that you understand why private software is not a good idea, mm -hmm. right? Because people that are then focused on their project and the growth and survival on their project. And so I think this is what, what I'm trying to do, but you know, with very relative success, but that's what I'm trying to do is let's build narratives that, that bring us together, right? That show how everything is related. And so I, I, what I try to use is use the commons as a concept to bring all the commons together. Yeah. Because a lot of, a lot of people are commoning that they don't know they are commoning. Right. <laughs> so, uh, so, you know, it's, so there is a book, The History of the English Working Class by E.P. Thompson, which I read, you know, in another lifetime, but it basically showed that it took, uh, you know, several decades because the workers, they were farmers that were expelled from their land, you know, and they came, uh, they had to go to the cities, but it took a long while before they said, oh, we're all in the same boat, we're all workers. Mm -hmm. we're, never going to back, we're never going back to the countryside, so we better organize ourselves as workers. Mm -hmm. and that gave the rise to the you know to the labor movement um and so i'm trying to kind of have the same effect as saying we're all commoners let's organize as commoners mm -hmm. now I, I can tell you what what feeds me is um uh, first of all you know i, I had a, a deep uh burnout and 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 psychological and spiritual crisis when i was 42 and I was lucky enough that everything went bad at the same time, uh, which means you you know you can't you can't hold anything, so I had to completely reinvent myself. And yeah. and strangely enough, what came up for me was I want to be engaged in making this world a better place. Mm -hmm. so that gave me the original strength. Is like a you know uh, there's a very nice book about this from William James uh, called The Varieties of Religious Experience. He shows that there's two kinds of people in the world, the once born and the twice born. The once born are lucky, they have a nice family, maybe a nice village, you know, um, and they can have a good life, but because they have a good life, they're not gonna challenge the system. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Some other people like me, you know, you get born and you say, what is this place? There's something wrong with it, you know? <laughs> uh, I, there must be a mistake here somewhere, you know? And then you have this moment in your life where everything is, you know, all these contradictions explode. And so that gives you an opportunity to kind of completely reinvent yourself. It causes a twice born uh, mm -hmm. process. So I, I really had that, I, I just felt it. Mm -hmm. And it just gave me a lot of strength uh, for a long time. And then I'm also lucky I have a, you know, Thai family mm -hmm. and, and, the Thai family functions as a common. So there were seven years, you know, the seven lean years where I had no money, basically no income. Yeah. Uh, I got free food, free clothing, free lodging, you know, and I knew that my wife hadn't married me for the money, <laughs> uh, as it were. Um, and so this was my, you know, my social security alternative because, you know, I, was, I had no social security and no medical insurance at all. So these are things that help. So you have to find around you, you know, people who are on the same journey. And uh, because I think increasingly we have to really look at the basics like, okay, are we going to have food in 20 years? Mm -hmm. Where do, if, where do we get the food if there is an, ex you know, an emergency? Yeah. Um, should where I'm going to live in 20 years, it doesn't make sense to pay rent all the time, but I cannot afford a house alone. Maybe there's a housing co-op or community land trust, right? Mm -hmm. So I think people have to and are going to slowly change their mind about that what they actually need to survive is mutualization, right? Mm -hmm. So a few pioneers, they do it out of idealistic reasons, but most people will do it just because they need to do it. Mm -hmm. And so what we have to do with the, you know, the first waves of people is create seed forms that are coherent enough 
mm-hmm. to when the crisis gets worse, that it can actually be a receptacle for people, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. And then there's an exodus out of the old system, and and the subsystem becomes stronger because it actually has found some solutions that the old system couldn't solve. Mm-hmm. So how far do you think have we uh, become uh, on this path towards being coherent enough? Because, you know, the, the seed forms, I mean, the, there are millions of them around the world. I would yes. Say, yeah? yes. So so we had a first phase of, you know, knowledge commons. Then we had a second phase of urban commons. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we are barely starting with the third phase, which I call the, the cosmolocal production commons. Uh, it has started in food and energy, you yeah. know, renewable energy co-ops and consumer supported agriculture. Yeah. Uh, where we are nowhere is in politics, right? Mm-hmm. The, I, I say this, and, and this is one of, the, of my failures, is I've been trying for 10 years to, to convince progressive politics that they need to pay attention to the commons. Yeah, and this is a very hard slog. It's just you know the Keynesian uh, mindset is still very dominant. Um, but, you know, some places it's starting to work. So I you know I very much uh, like the the French ecologists uh, in Brussels, who are in the government and actually are in charge of uh, economic transition. Uh, and of course, in Italy, you have this wave of. Uh, public commons regulations that are now active in 250 cities and have mobilized 800,000 Italians mm. doing commons work in the city. Uh, so there's some bright spots, but overall, you know, the, um, the, the left is disintegrating and the right wing uh, populist is you know, winning in many places. And they are, they are very much in a story of, you know, uh, reg- regression to nation state politics. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there's a lot of things that we cannot solve at the nation state level. So, you know, we need a new multilateralism, we need new forms of translocality, transnationality. And I don't see yet the political force that is pushing this agenda. Mm-hmm. So th- that we are nowhere, you know, in, in terms of politics and policy, we are at a very low level compared to what we where we would need to be. Yeah. Um, do you think that, uh, you know, seeing it in terms of left and right uh, is uh, approaching it from, from uh, the correct angle? Uh, so are these distinctions still valid? Uh, because I, I think they're completely dissolving, you know, and uh, uh, questions. This is a difficult question for me, because for me, left and right is a result of equality or the lack of equality, right? So. Okay. So in the abstract, as long as we will have inequality, there will be this tension between people who want to redistribute more and people who don't want to redistribute at all or, or want to redistribute less. I think this is a, a given. Um, but because the left has lost its connection with the, the working class, the, especially mm-hmm. the native working class, uh, this, I think, creates the effect we have now where, you know, uh, the local working classes as it were, have more trust in the right than in the left. Mm -hmm. Because the right, what it has going for it is, it speaks about community. Mm -hmm. You know, it says the national community, we have to restore the national community. And so all the people feel overwhelmed by globalization, who think there's too much migration and, you know, these kinds of people, will will connect with that they will say oh these people will protect us mm-hmm. um, and i think the left doesn't have a story right now that that has the same effect um i you know i'd be willing to work with everybody around you know that that is that is has policies that promote the commons basically mm-hmm. um, um, but yeah and i think it's important to understand each other you know right independently of the political divisions yeah. is we, these are humans they have a different point of view but let's look at commonalities mm-hmm, mm-hmm. right yeah yeah uh and uh you know you you talked about the narrative that you would like to create uh you you mentioned uh overwhelm and uh, desire for protection uh 
do you think that these are uh, important ingredients for a new narrative or should a new narrative uh, contain I don't know empowerment or, or other elements so what what is the desire of uh, most people would help? Uh, yes of course I mean what I like is um, there's a French woman called Geneviève Fontaine and she recently defended her PhD which was a marriage between Ostrom and Amartya Sen right mm -hmm. so Ostrom is about the commons. She got the Nobel Prize in 2009. Mm -hmm. And Amartya Sen is all about empowering, you know, uh, capacitating uh, people. And there's also the work of Bernard Stiegler in, in France and in Saint-Denis, which is, uh, you know, the, the migrant neighborhoods around Paris, which have a, a lot of issues, where he's uh, doing a 10-year uh, experiment around contributive income. So yes, it, we have to be, so the commons is an extraordinary means to preserve resources, right? It's the only human institution that has proven throughout history that it can maintain a resource base of a society. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not enough because, you know, that's only conserving, right? So the dynamic element has to come from somewhere else. Yeah. Um, and so I, I don't know yet exactly what that story is, but yes, I, I agree with you. We need a story that is about empowerment. And um, but I, I have this idea that common projects are you know a very good tool to do that, right? Once you can convince people that they can do something together, this also gives an enormous amount of energy of people. Mm -hmm. uh, now there's one thing that I briefly would like to mention. So our systems today are based on extraction, right? You extract the surplus value from labor and from cheap resources. Yes. Um, and then we tax them and we redistribute it afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, so the problem with this system is that if you do something good, like a form of agriculture, which is more respectful of the soil, you, 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 will, you will integrate costs that a purely capitalist enterprise will not want to take on, mm -hmm. right? So this is a structural failure, which means that generative activity is not easily funded mm -hmm. in our system, right? Mm -hmm. So we always marginalize. Um, you know that fossil fuels get like 600 trillion, I, I hope maybe it's 600 billion, but anyway, it's a huge amount of money mm. from the government it's about 10 times more than renewable energy right yeah so we don't we there's no fair level playing field so i'm i'm in favor of experimenting with new forms of public funding mm. uh you know public commons funding mm. i'll give you an example so we need to decarbonize yeah uh what we could do is say we want to mobilize the whole society to decarbonize. Mm -hmm. So we create a public ledger, you know, public accounting system where everybody can let let can have the verification done of his decarbonization decarbonization efforts, right? Mm -hmm. So you're recognized by society if you've done this. Then it's tokenized. Mm -hmm. We now can create these, you know, digital tokens, and then we look for all the institutions in society and business in society which profit from this positive externality, right? Mm -hmm. And they fund the tokens and the tokens fund the people doing the generative activity. So I want to create more and more of these virtuous cycles where we recognize positive social and ecological externalities that are not recognized in our current system. So I talk about value sovereignty and value pluralism, right? So that we have to recognize as a society that value is not only market value. Market value depends on scarcity and the tension between supply and demand. Mm -hmm. There are other forms of value, you know, like caring, education of small children, uh, volunteering, mm -hmm. uh, regener regenerative agriculture. Um, so we need to find techniques that allow us to, for society to recognize regenerative activity and to create funding mechanisms. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so that you know the minority of pioneers actually become the norm there's another proposal i, I briefly want to share with you yeah. which is the common good economy which is actually an austrian born movement 
right? Where Christian Felber says, every constitution in Europe says that the economy should serve the common good. Mm -hmm. And we can measure the common good. It's not mm -hmm. abstract. And so he's developed with, with his movement uh, an accounting system with 17 clusters of impact. Mm -hmm. So then we can say, why don't we subsidize and tax people according to their positive impact? Yeah. So the more positive impact, the more support you get, the more negative impact, the more we tax you and the less support you get. You see what mm -hmm. I mean? So that would mean that we have a system in, in society where policy could constantly reward the, the regenerative activity. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the whole incentive system basically has to change. Yes. Um, and of course, we have to start at the local level and experiment and show that it works. But this is kind of the overall direction that I think we should be moving towards. Mm -hmm. um, what you described about this ledger, um, that sounds like very concrete, uh, but how, to what extent would it already be possible, you know, like technically feasible? apart from yeah there, well there is one project called region network which is doing that in the field of agriculture mm -hmm. um and i have actually a whole report about it p2p accounting for uh planetary survival mm -hmm. so the basic thesis is the following if you want to go to a circular economy mm -hmm. we have to share logistics and accounting because capitalist accounting only looks at what comes in and what comes out from me mm -hmm. uh, and how much am i keeping it has no ecosystemic view, right? Which we have to move to com completely private competition based to collaborative ecosystems. Mm -hmm. um, so what I'm, what I'm not saying is abolish the market. So it's not saying, you know, we cannot have competition at all, but the basis has to be a collaboration ecosystem. Within that, you can still be better than somebody else. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, but you can join a collaborative ecosystem. Um, and so now there is a form of accounting that is called flow accounting or REA accounting, resources, events, agents. Mm -hmm. So you and I are agents. We have a resource. I'm going to sell it to you. That's the action, right? REA. And this accounting system has no double entry. It only gives you the, your place in the ecosystem. So this is what we need. Then we have contributive accounting, which has been pioneered by you know, these kind of peer production communities that I mentioned before, mm -hmm. which allows a community internally to decide what value is for itself. Mm -hmm. And so basically you create a, um, a membrane around your ecosystem and you redistribute what comes out from the outside according to your own criteria. Mm -hmm. And this allows you to recognize other forms of value. Finally, there's a third form of accounting, which is called thermodynamic accounting or sometimes called multi-capitalism so the idea here is that today the problem is only financial scams. so if you do something bad with your financials you can go to jail but you can destroy people and nature and nothing will happen to you right mm -hmm. so we have to integrate uh, this into our accounting system and especially in nature so we know that market pricing doesn't reflect you know, ecological constraints. So we actually need to know how much of nature we can spend. And their studies show that we have to stay under 1% material growth, otherwise we're exponential and the circular economy doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So that means that an example would be, we would have a global threshold and allocation council, a group of scientists which keeps track of the copper and the fuel and you know anything we need but also keeps track of the, the reproduction necessity. So, uh, you know, how much copper can we reuse after we use it once? It's, I think it's about 70%. And eventually new finds, right? So you keep kind of a global accounting and then you, may, you lower it into bioregional, regional, corporate, cooperative entities. So that every human entity has a kind of a view of the better energy flow in which it is inserted and that it can not overuse. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. So I guess- so all, so all these things exist as experimental projects, mm -hmm. as you know, software programs. What we need is a vision to bring them together. And that's what I try to do in this last report is like, 
basically trying to argue we already have the technology we need mm -hmm. you know let's mm -hmm. let's try to fund more ambitious experiments so that they can start working together and build this you know kind of global collaborative uh, collaborative ecosystem mm -hmm. that we need yeah to live in harmony with with nature yeah well, uh, it, it would perfectly take into account uh, the, the the problem of the planetary boundaries, you know. So. Exactly. That's actually uh, Kate Wayworth who developed the donut mm -hmm. economy. Yeah. Where she shows eight critical functions that are half of them already endangered. Mm -hmm. And then there's the white hole in the middle of the donut, which is unsatisfied social needs. There's still 800 million people that are hungry in the world, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So how to use, how to be in harmony with nature and still solve these uh, human issues. Yeah. And so basically what I, would, what I would say to summarize it that, you know, the 19th century was a system of domination of capital over labor. Mm -hmm. And then we fought, had this big fight between parliamentary democracy, fascism and communism. And it ended up in a new multilateral system that was based on the welfare state, a compact between capital and labor. Now it has been undermined, but it's it's not dead. It's still it's still quite there in, in some ways. What we don't have is a compact with nature, right? Mm -hmm. So this transition is about that. It's about finding ways to live as humanity within the bounds of nature seeing nature as partner you know we need the bees we have to partner with the bees mm -hmm. um, and at the same time restore a level of social contract because if we don't do it then the poor will never accept any ecological a uh, compact yeah. right so it's mm -hmm. this is a difficulty it's going to be a very difficult transition period because we have to solve these two issues at the same time yes with a very strong oligarchy, which has been, you know, concentrating resources for the last 30 years. Um, and it's creating an explosive situation. Mm -hmm. um, so, and you said there are already experiments going on in this direction. Uh, so what technology is it based on? Is this a blockchain based technology or how does yes, it? Yes, so I, I talk also about Post blockchain because the mm -hmm. so the issue with the blockchain and Bitcoin it was designed by you know market libertarian philosophy mm -hmm. so these are people who believe that every individual is a market player mm -hmm. uh, and they want a horizontal market but the problem is they they think a market is horizontal and it's and it's not horizontal because of the state that's what they think right and I think that's a wrong analysis. If you play Monopoly, you know, mm -hmm. we all start equal, but you always end up with one person having everything. Mm -hmm. It's the rules of the game, and any competition for scarce resources you know, creates an iterative game where the, the winner of one round is already stronger than the others, right? And mm -hmm. so it, it just creates concentration that it can't help. It's, it's a natural law. Mm -hmm. And so this means that if we want a reasonably equal society, we have to create anti-oligarchic protocols right we have to create systems that we maintain a level of distribution that is reasonable mm -hmm. bottom and top are you know are kind of managed even better and this is you know what the report is about we can go straight towards distribution a pre-distribution which is creating collaborative ecosystems where there is already equity from the beginning already inscribed in the rules and this is the interesting thing about the blockchain that even though it has these, you know, kind of hyper liberal designs, we can change them, right? We can do post blockchain distributed ledgers. So we can have, instead of the blockchain, we can have the hollow chain, which is based on the principles of nature. It's a biomimetic system where basically instead of having one world computer, they say, let's have everybody has its own, you know, ledger for its own project but we create a way so that they can interconnect when they want to. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, no use of excessive energy like in Bitcoin. Um, and so this is all in a report is how can we redesign the blockchain, which is interesting because it creates, it's open source and it's based on community and collaborative ecosystems ideas, but it is extractive towards the outside, right? Mm -hmm. So how can we at the same time collaborate internally 
without excessive extraction outside the boundaries of our ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I hope this is all not too complicated. Are you, Lali? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's quite, yeah. yeah because uh, it seems that, you know, at some stage we have to pull things together and we have to, to get this uh, sort of overview of how we basically handle our planet. Yeah, I guess this is yeah, what absolutely. Really leads up to. And, and many people are doing it, you know, it's just that it's not gelling yet, right? But, but that's what I try to do with the P2P Foundation in our wiki with 22,000 articles to be a permanent observatory of this emergence. And the rule in our wiki is it has to exist. So mm -hmm. I, I don't want to be in the space where it should be that way, you know, just because I say, no, I want to show what is happening, how people are responding to the crisis and how they're finding solutions. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about this a little. So does this mean when people get interested in uh, everything you've uh, talked about that they can go to your wiki and find all these examples? So how, how can they do that? Uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, wiki.p2pfoundation.net. Mm -hmm. And when you arrive on the first page, you have three columns, uh, one about us and all kinds of things. On the right, Kind of more formal organization books videos podcasts but in the middle you have all the subjects we cover mm -hmm. um, so this is where you can find how is p2p and the commons influencing spirituality how is p2p in the commons influencing housing healthcare, mm -hmm. transportation we all have it mm -hmm. it's it's a very rich resource it's it's you know we can be complete and it's only in english mm -hmm. but Everything that's in English, you will find no other source that is so complete and so comprehensive as our wiki. It's just like, you know, been maintaining this for 10 years and working two, three hours a day on it. So this is, you know, serious stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's uh, absolutely fantastic work, you know, and you've, uh, you've been at it for, uh, for such a long time. So uh, it's, it's really amazing. Uh, it's uh, it could nearly be overwhelming, you know, when we when people look. It is it is overwhelming. So it is overwhelming. <laughs> so, but it has a very good search uh, box, right? So, if you search anything specific, it will show you the articles. And if you want more, you will have the categories underneath, and then you can click on the categories and see the whole picture. Mm -hmm. uh, but in any case, yeah. But you can read the books, right? So I have a, a book in French and in Dutch. Mm -hmm. uh, very modestly titled Saving the World uh, <laughs> in English and in French. Then we have P2P, the Commons Manifesto. Mm -hmm. uh, then um, we have published every year, we have published specialized reports, specialized synthesis. So there's one called Value in the Commons. Mm -hmm. There's one called Commons Based Urban Transitions. There's one called P2P Accounting and Planetary Survival. Uh, and so all these are like a synthesis of a certain field, right? Mm -hmm. okay. Now it's not written. It's not written for everybody. I I talk about the general lay person. So you maybe you've done uh, you know just the two first years of university. Um, yeah. So but you you need some level of you know being able to handle complexity. I've, you know I I would like to find other people who do the other work. But we do actually have a primer, uh, which is actually meant for everyone. So you can check that out. It's, it's called, uh, I think it's called a primer on the commons. And it's, it's mm -hmm. full of illustrations and, and, and graphics. And so it's, it's designed to be read more easily. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Uh, so uh, let me just um, maybe conclude with a final uh, question to you. Uh, what is your best hope for for the future? Where do you think uh, we, uh, in the best case, we are going? Well, I'm I'm reading uh, this book. Uh, I don't know if you can see it. Uh, Rethinking the world from Peter world. Pagani. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I tell you his thesis, which I think is a realistic one. He says mm -hmm. that society is a complex adaptive system mm -hmm. and that these systems 
they only change through chaotic transitions. Yes. Um, so that means you have a stable system. It works for a while. And then there's too much, too many contradictions emerging and it will go through a period of chaotic transition. So I'll give you an example. You have what he calls global system zero is, you know, the mercantile system in Europe and it ends with the French revolution uh, until 1815, right? A very chaotic period of, of wars in Europe. But it, what emerges out of it is the Smithian capitalist system, which is pure capitalism, laissez-faire, and the dominion of capital over labor. Um, and this works, but it stops in 1914. So you have 1914, 1945, a period of chaos in Europe. You know, it's like it just mm -hmm. never stops. But after 45, you have what he calls global system two, which is based on a compact between capital and labor and multilateral organizations, which you didn't have in the previous system. So that works for quite a while, but basically stopped working in 2008. Mm -hmm. So this means that we are actually now in a chaotic transition. And given, you know, the, the severity of the crisis in the past, it means, unfortunately, that we can expect very serious consequences, right? But on the other side of the tunnel, mm -hmm. there is a likelihood of this new system, which has learned how to live in harmony with nature. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I cannot give you only a beautiful story. Mm -hmm. um, but I still think that politics and policy and self-organization are absolutely crucial because it will determine the level of smoothness of the transition, right? Yeah. If we don't do it, and the less we do it, the higher the price. The more we do it, the more we transition in advance, the more we find solution in advance, the smoother we can do this transition. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, unfortunately, I have a tragic consciousness about this. It's not a feel-good story, mm -hmm. uh, but it, it 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 is it does come also with some immediate uh, you know bonuses because once you start working with other people, once you start creating solidarity systems with other people, it does enrich your life. You know, you are you become relationally richer, and especially you have a, a story that mobilizes your energy. So that you can work with others for something beautiful and that's also very important in dark times is that you have you know you, there's this famous book uh, the meaning what's it called again um, from victor franco um mm -hmm. you know what i mean uh, yeah. it's, it has a meaning in the title right so he was in the concentration camps and there's somewhere in the book he says the only people who survived more than a week were the capitalists and the com uh, the the Catholics and the communists, right? Mm -hmm. Because once you were in a concentration camp, it was so dark that you wanted to die. Yeah. You know, this was no light at the end of the tunnel. But if you had a strong internal belief system, and no matter whether it's true or not, right? But you had something to look forward to afterwards. Like you mm -hmm. said, this is only temporary. We'll get out of this. You know, we, we are fighting for this better world. And this gave the people life energy, right? So, mm -hmm. of course, any human story can never be fully 100% the right thing. We don't know what the future will bring. But if it's coherent with what is happening, if it's open to correct its mistake, you can create, you know, the most integrative narrative that aligns the highest number of people to a common goal. That's That's basically very you know in my with my own modest means what i'm trying to do mm -hmm. and you know and other people right so yeah yeah well okay uh michelle so thank you very very much uh, i guess you have given us a kind of a story of hope uh, because you've shown us a vision uh, a vision of things that not only are utopian in in the future but uh, that exist already and that are done by many people around the world uh, if uh, only in seed form uh, and uh, in ways uh, even more than that 
uh, you at the Peer-to-Peer -peer Foundation examine exactly how it works and uh, document this. Uh, so uh, we're talking about very real and very concrete things here. And I guess, uh, as you've outlined uh, at the end now, it's so important that we deal with these things, that we look at yes. them uh, and that we uh, put them into reality and practice them as much as possible. With all the advantages it brings, you know, it brings us together as, as uh, human beings. Uh, it, uh, it is good for the environment uh, and uh, it, um, it protects us in a way when it empowers yes. us at the same time. So I guess that's a, that's a beautiful um, vision and a beautiful story of hope. Um, so uh, let's work on it. Uh, I thank you very, very much for being my guest uh, today on the, on this uh, podcast, on this talk. Thank and you. I wish you all the best of uh, luck and success for uh, for this uh, for path. Thank you so much, Michelle. Thank you to Ryan. I, I know you do a lot of good work in Austria with Mutmacherei. So yeah, I am very happy uh, that you do this and. And good luck with everything and also the, the people in your audience. Thank you.